Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, welcome to the sixth meeting in 2020 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, before we move to agenda item, I would like to welcome Alexander Stewart back to the committee, uh, who joins us to replace Tom Mason. And I would like to thank Tom for the time that he spent on the committee and made his contributions. So, Alexander, I would like to invite you to declare any relevant interests you may have, please. Thank you, Convener. Delighted to return to this committee, and I have no declarations of interest that are appropriate to this committee. No, thank you very much for that. Thank you. OK, um, so agenda item one, our first item for today is the committee to agree to take agenda item four in private, which is an item to consider the evidence we will hear today from the Commissioner and her team. Uh, do members agree to take this item in private? Thank you. Agenda item two is for the committee to agree to consider correspondence that is received and also for the recommendations on the Commission on Parliamentary Reform in private future meetings. Uh, do members agree to take this item in private? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, agenda item three then, uh, the main meet of today. Um, agenda item three is an evidence session with the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland on her annual report and strategic plan. And joining us today are the Commissioner, Caroline Anderson, welcome to you, Ian Bruce and Malcolm Campbell. Uh, Martin Campbell, I do apologise. Um, so, I'd like to welcome you all to the meeting and I invite the Commissioner to make a short opening statement, if you could care to. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present evidence to the committee today. As this is my first such evidence session, I would like to open with a short introductory statement outlining the steps that I've taken in my role as Commissioner over the past 10 months, first in relation to complaints and then in relation to public appointments. This more recent information will give the committee an up-to-date picture. The annual report and the public appointments report, both relating to 2018 to 19, that being before my own appointment. I am, of course, ready to answer questions on these reports to my best ability. I also have senior members of my team here to address any points of detail. I'm a qualified chartered accountant with expertise in regulation and compliance developed over the past three decades, spanning public and private sector roles in professional services and financial services, both in local jurisdictions and internationally. When I took up office on the 1st of April 2019, I reviewed operations and found the situation with councillor complaints to be significantly in arrears. The outstanding investigation legacy dated back to August 2018 and was of great concern to me. Having held many quasi-judicial and determinative roles, including disciplinary tribunal and investigative roles focused on the application of codes of conduct, I have extensive experience in this area. That experience makes me acutely aware of the negative impact of protracted investigation completion times on those elected representatives involved. At the 1st of April 2019, this legacy equated to the average number of reports submitted to the Standards Commission in an 18-month period. I have a very small office and there were critical levels of vacant posts when I took over. The situation was made even more pressing by the upcoming expansion of investigation work to include sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour complaints, and indeed an overall backdrop of rising complaints volume. I had to implement a recovery plan very quickly to avoid further delays and to secure greater effectiveness and efficiency in complaint handling in order to be ready for increased demand. Previously, my office had predominantly used home-based variable hours contractors as investigators, each working an average of only 10 hours per week. Uh, with full SPCB approval, I moved quickly to recruit site-based investigators who have come highly recommended from Scottish public sector employees and employers and international and local law firms. They include qualified lawyers and experienced investigators with outstanding qualifications and skill. 
My new senior investigating officer, Mr Campbell, took up post in June 2019 with other new full-time investigators taking up post in December 2019. This team is moving quickly through legacy investigations, producing high calibre work. In moving to full-time investigators, it has been possible to double the annual working hours available to more efficiently service complaints investigations. Additionally, both complainers and respondents are now benefiting from having a dedicated full-time on-site investigator servicing their complaint. We have already received notable positive feedback on this greatly enhanced service. These changes address a long-standing issue of the length of time taken to complete investigations as raised by various stakeholders over the years. I'm also aware that investigator salaries have come under scrutiny by this committee in past years. The move to full-time investigators has doubled available investigation hours whilst reducing salary costs by £75,000. These new salaries are in line with a regrading exercise carried out with the support of the SPCB. Former investigators had preserved rights from prior public sector posts with an associated high price tag. Apologies, but due to HR and data protection issues concerning individuals in a small office, I can't go into much further detail. In addition to putting the new staff in place, I have overseen work to put the many years delayed case management system into operation. In addition, all IT hardware and software has been replaced as required, creating a robust platform from which to deliver a newly effective and efficient complaints handling approach. Since April 2019, incoming complaints have significantly increased. Councillor complaints are up 90% pro rata, with councillor case numbers up by 50% pro rata. MSP complaints are up 500% pro rata and cases are up 100% on the previous period. Despite this increase and the fact that the new IOs are only in post since December, MSP complaints are completely up to date and the vast majority of councillor complaints have been assessed through to the past few weeks intake. I have introduced codification of procedures drawn from legislation <coughs> to ensure transparency and robustness of approach in readiness for the upcoming scope expansion. To conclude my coverage of complaints investigation, I would like to alert members to the heightened complexity and gravitas of incoming complaints. For the first time since the relevant legislation was enacted some two decades ago, my office has, over the past six months, commenced three cases which required an interim report with the potential suspension of the councillor concerned pending full investigation. This represents a significant escalation in the legal complexity and profile of casework being handled. Turning then to public appointments, we can celebrate a milestone year in respect of gender equality, which also creates a pipeline for better diversity in future board chairs of Scottish public bodies. Other diversity metrics have been slower to improve. My office previously recommended various diversity-related actions which have not been adopted, the Scottish Government having opted for a partnership working on request approach. With a revision to the Public Appointments Code of Practice scheduled for later in 2020, I now envisage a move towards a more traditional regulatory relationship. If the current code is not delivering, for example in terms of board diversity, then I can revise the code with a view to promoting practices that will deliver this outcome. <coughs> These matters are expanded upon in my public appointments report and in my strategic plan, which covers all office functions for the period of my tenure. Thank you for the opportunity to make these introductory remarks. I look forward to answering your questions and we particularly welcome any feedback on my strategic plan. Thank you. No, thank you very much indeed, Commissioner. Um, we do have some questions. Some of them will be based on 
what you've said there, some of them on the reports that you um, have kindly released and we have had a chance to have a look at. And uh, can I ask Jamie Halker Johnson if you'd like to start off, please? Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, so, uh, thank you for, the, for that opening statement. Some of the uh, areas that I wanted to cover have, have, have been covered to some extent, but <coughs> I just wanted to look. You, you said uh, at the start of your term of, of office it was challenging and dynamic. Um, could you give us a bit more uh, detail in terms of uh, the challenging aspect and also the impact that may have had on the complaints, on the office itself, etc.? Well, um, in my uh, annual report, I advise uh, the reader that I faced some key issues when I took up post, uh, and there were three main points to this which were very challenging. Uh, the first was that I had a backlog of investigation reports which uh, were very sizable in terms of the usual workload for the office. Uh, in terms of draft reports, it was equivalent to a year to a year and a half's worth of reports that are uh, submitted to the Standards Commission. By that I mean in a given year, uh, over the past recent years, it would be usually between six and eight reports are referred, submitted to the Standards Commission in any given year. And I found myself uh, with a legacy which included uh, 18 months worth of draft reports with still much to do on them. So that was a, a huge legacy really in terms of investigation reports. Surely. Sorry, was that just down to um, a, a lack of staff capacity to, to deal with those? Or were there other reasons for that backlog? <coughs> other reason for that backlog? Uh, I'm... Uh, not completely clear of all the, the reasons for the backlog because I w wasn't in um, post during the time that the backlog accumulated. Um, but in addressing that backlog, I felt that if protracted investigation times were something that were flagged up over many years by stakeholders, uh, that really increase in effectiveness and efficiency was incumbent upon me going forward um, and particularly given the stresses that it obviously um, put upon the elected members involved in complaints. Uh, so I address the situation as I find it on taking over post. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the next point that I'm going to come on to is about staff shortage and in the absence of the most senior and legally qualified staff member in the office, the information wasn't really available to me, the, the detailed explanations of how the situation had eventuated. So I, can, I know my colleagues will cover some of that, but I just wanted to check, why was that, why was that member of staff not available to you? Well, they had resigned in autumn in the previous year. And were they, were they approached at all to give any information or feedback in terms uh, of what was clearly not, not working at the organisation? I had a brief meeting with the individual uh, concerned, but they had moved on to another post. And uh, therefore, whilst I, I did gather some information, um, it was partial, you know, in terms of... Um, completing my view of the situation. Mm. The, the other issue is that the organisation had worked in a rather siloed way mm. in the past uh, and therefore knowledge of complaints uh, was minimal within those uh, staff members who were remaining within the organisation at that date. Okay. Um, just to be honest... S oh, sorry, so could I, could yes, I just... One, one other issue in regards to the reports, um, if, if the member pleases... Uh, is that uh, in the months prior to my taking over, some four um, investigation reports had been submitted to the Standards Commission uh, and unfortunately uh, there was no one in place when I took over to present those reports. So uh, the other uh, issue that I was faced with was quickly putting legal representation in place to present uh, the majority of those cases to the Standards Commission. Um, I, I tried to reschedule, but apparently my predecessor had already 
rescheduled some or all of them and therefore uh, it wasn't I was told it wasn't possible to do that again uh, which uh, which gave another challenge in the reports side of, of the matter it was an additional problem and, and exactly okay. exactly um, in, in your government statement you state that incomplete audit trail uh, sorry an incomplete audit trail existed in relation to certain records in the complainants handling function of the os uh, office can you give us a, a brief idea of how that impacts in practice um, and you know particularly on the cases you were dealing with certainly so the issue that I discovered uh, was that um, draft investigation reports are obviously produced in the first instance and then with discussion and review uh, the matters that are raised in the draft are refined either accepted or rejected and a report would move uh, through various iterations until it reaches a final draft stage. Uh, so I discovered that these draft versions of the reports were being deleted at a fairly early stage after the completion of the final report. And in the loss of those draft versions, we were losing all of the analysis and thinking around various points which had been considered but rejected. Uh, and that thinking obviously has a value internally uh, in terms of precedents and uh, learnings to share with current and future staff, as well as being available to us to explain, uh, you know, the, the thinking on a current report. Uh, so I uh, stopped that basically, uh, so that the uh, very valuable audit trail, which is complete presented by those uh, draft reports is, is available to us through the various iterations. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time and, and colleagues have got questions. I just wanted to, uh, two, two kind of fairly simple questions. Uh, you had a backlog of cases, you had um, staff shortages, um, you had key staff not available to give you advice, incomplete audit trail. Was the organisation fit for purpose when you took over? Uh, well, uh, basically, it was of great concern to me the situation that I found the organisation to be in and not, uh, I wouldn't have been happy to preside over the organisation in uh, that state. Uh, my focus is always on efficiency and effectiveness and I felt there was much improvement that could be made. Uh, the organisation, I understand, historically had been emerging of uh, different offices and I felt it was time for a complete review uh, to put it on a sound footing going forward. Okay, thank you. My last question, very simple. Outside of the organisation itself uh, and those that you advise, who, who was aware of the problems that you were facing when you took over? Um, well, I alerted uh, the SPCB to the issues that I encountered at a very early stage due to the degree of my concern. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Maureen Watt, would you like to follow? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I think you've um, explained um, how you've managed to to double the number of hours um, that people work and also by taking on new people reducing your staff costs if I understand it which you hope to make a saving of, of £75,000 a year on the staff costs is that correct? Yes on the staff costs. Okay um, clearly you've uh, experienced a level of service re re disruption um, can you give us an idea of just what that disruption actually means and you said that your handling of MS complaints on, on MSPs is up to date. How up to date are you on, for example, the, the backlog on councillors' uh, complaints? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the level of service disruption uh, which came with the restructure uh, occurred over the summer months. Um, now, over the summer months with recess and parliament and just holidays generally, there's less happening in the political sphere and therefore we tend to see a fall off both in the volume of complaints coming through the door, phone calls, just the general level of 
productivity decreases. So therefore, whilst there was a disruption, uh, whilst we migrated to the new case management system and moved to the remodel staff uh, structure, etc., um, it wouldn't have been any more perceptible externally, I would have thought, than the, the previous um, uh, suboptimal uh, operation that, that I encountered when I took over. Um, in terms of councillor complaints, uh, you're, the members, of course, quite right that the volume is greater there, and uh, it, they, the legacy was was entirely in the councillor complaints. However, despite the fact that uh, the new team are only in post since December, we have moved through the legacy very quickly. And uh, really, the assessments are up to date, more or less up to date, uh, other than uh, a number of um, cases where we're waiting for information to come in from the, the respondents or indeed the complainers concerned. Uh, so we're, we're harvesting more information to finalise those assessments. So uh, in terms of the investigation numbers, well, I handle the investigations in two streams. Um, because of the uh, high gravitas matters that I mentioned in my opening statement, which are connected to sometimes to interim reports, sometimes to just just uh, difficult legal matters, etc. Uh, I have those in a separate stream. And Mr. Campbell, being the most uh, qualified and experienced legal person in the office, handles those in his position as director of investigations, obviously with my, myself as well, but I'm just saying they're in a stream. So uh, they're currently being worked on, worked through and uh, handled in a quickly and timely fashion. Um, you will appreciate that we do have matters where there are multiple complaints within one case and that the complaints come in over time, even though it's one case, the complaints could come in over a matter of nine months. So, you know, uh, it, it's not always cut and dry from, from that point of view. Uh, in relation then to the other work stream, which let's say is your, your more normal councillor complaints, not just the, the stream that Mr. Campbell has, um, we're, I think, counted it that we're down to about 10, so we are on that now. So uh, I consider that to be a, a, a significant uh, improvement, uh, given that the volume increase that I mentioned is so huge uh, over the past year. So given the volume increase, I feel that we're very on top of the situation. Can I just tease this out a bit? Is sure. it that there are complaints about more councillors or are there more complaints about the same or a smaller number of councillors? So let, just let me get my figures up uh, because I want to give the... And, and while, while you're looking at that, maybe Mr Campbell, so are you dealing with a stream of the more serious cases um, and do you prioritise when a very serious case comes in? I mean, we have a situation where we have a person still acting as a councillor with a criminal record. That's that's correct. I, the, the intention, as I my sort of day to day case work, is, uh, is focused on the more serious cases. Um, obviously, couldn't talk about any specific case, but there are there are measures in place to take interim interim steps um, if if the kind of statutory tests are met for that. Um, that does require the necessary evidence. To be, to be gathered before those steps can be taken. So while while things publicly might come out quite quickly, there's, there is a, a kind of natural lag in terms of getting some documentary evidence in that, that backs up information that might be in the public domain. Okay. Uh, so yes, sorry, coming back to mm. the complaint numbers, uh, for the councillor complaints, uh, the actual complaints uh, are up uh, nearly 100% pro rata, but of course there is some duplication within that. So the actual case numbers, the actual numbers that could convert into an investigation are up 50%. Okay, thank you. A, a full analysis, of course, will be available after the year end. Uh, you know, we'll give okay. an annual analysis of all the complaint numbers and cases. And, um, 
you talked about you, you know you've talked about the, the the restructure and the disruption that there was but you know that was sort of over the summer so that you, you, I suppose you got ahead of, of yourself a bit over the summer um how confident are you that you know the re restructure that you've done is leading to a sustained improvement so that you know we'll get to a situation where you don't have such a big backlog and that you you are really um, on top of things. Um, okay. I'm completely confident and of course the, the thing is that, that as we've discussed um, we're a demand led organisation uh, we're an open door so you know uh, I have no control over how many complaints come in or uh, when the pattern of them etc <clears throat> pardon me um, and obviously the volume that will eventuate from the scope extension is an unknown entity as well uh, however um, what I feel is that one has to get on top of the current situation uh, and and then in in that I work ahead I always like to be ahead of the curve uh, so given the situation we're in now uh, I feel that we're shortly going to be ahead of that curve and then we'll be able to consider being a good place to consider as other matters eventuate for example a, a volume uh, arising from the scope expansion for example if that eventuates we'll be a good in a good position to respond in a timely manner uh, so we're ahead of the curve now. Okay, and you said you made um, savings on staff costs, but the restructure itself um, seems to have been up more than you um, had budgeted for. Was that because of the transfer that you talked about to um, a new system or? Well, I, I don't, um, we're sorry, talking I didn't about budget for anything, sorry. So uh, on, on pages uh, seven and 11, um, you had anticipated un unanticipated costs associated with the restructure. What were those? Well, yes, because I only took up post on the 1st of April 2019, and then obviously uh, at that point I recognised these challenges, okay. took a strategic overview, and then put together a proposal that would um, answer those and uh, produce an effective and efficient complaint handling system and then approach the SPCB for approval of that restructuring package so it was you know it was a new yeah. and discreet matter as it were okay thank you thank you thank you very much Maureen thank you Commissioner um can we move on to um the annual report again and complaints against MSPs and um, Gil Patterson please thanks very much um a similar co question to my colleague in regards to you explained that it's a 500% increase in complaints in regards to MSPs. And is that similar? Is that more complaints about an individual? Or is this, is this the number of MSPs that have dramatically increased? Uh, the, num the total number of MSP cases, individual cases, um, are up 100%. So they've 100%. doubled. So they've doubled on the previous year. Um, yes. And could you characterise that? Is, a, is there a theme? Is it because of the work done in particular this committee in regards to uh, sexual abuse and abuse and no. bullying? It's not. So it's not a. It's not a particular thing. Uh, it's definitely, uh, unless my memory is failing me, uh, no, not uh, no, anything to do with right, uh, okay. the inappropriate behaviour matters. Yeah. Uh, I did look down at in anticipation of you know the members being interested in this area, but there was no immediate pattern emerging really. Yeah, I, uh, I suppose the thing, just generally, I would say is, uh, it's just social media and media driven. You know that. Uh, something no sooner happens than it's out there and um, if it catches the public's attention then it eventuates and, and can eventuate in a large number of complaints you know uh, yeah and so is that associated i see that that um there was 20 complaints against msps but 75 percent were not admissible a 15 of them it, it continues so sorry it, beg it, your it, pardon. is it in relation to the uh, on the web type of complaints that are coming in or 
I mean, that's a phenomenal amount. Is there anything? It is. I, I would. I just think that um, the public are so aware of media, social okay. media, and media, and hmm. um, it, it just is stimulated by the, the political debate and political events. Hmm. Um, I'd be happy to provide uh, those figures when we shortly get to the year end a full analysis of uh, the, the the complaints, the the source of them, any breakdown that I could. Uh, supply for for the entire f accounting year, if that would be helpful, uh, I can send yes, that, that through to I'm, members I'm of sure an that earlier. Would be very useful to the committee, and associated with that, uh, is there anything that you, your office or the Parliament can do to dissuade people from making these type of complaints, or is it just part of the? The way things are, and it's a necessary <laughs> evil that we need to put up with. That. I'm not well, sure myself. Well, uh, I suppose there, there's sort of two two parts to that. Uh, please, if I can answer that, I think there's an inherent value in having a body uh, to which a member of the electorate can complain if they're unhappy uh, with uh, their an MSP and the behaviour. Um, so whether that falls within the bounds of, of the code, which is within my remit or not, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, it's a public service uh, to have that facility. And indeed, uh, we will write back to every such person with a detailed letter explaining, you know, why we can or can't, why I can or can't uh, proceed with that particular complaint uh, or directing them to be it the presiding officer, if it's conduct in Parliament or engagement with constituents, to the First Minister, if it's an MSP acting as a minister type complaint, you know. So uh, I think there is uh, value in that inherently. Um, and the, looking at the other side of it, um, I think that in an information overloaded world, uh, I think it, it's not really fair to expect the public um, to become experts on codes of conduct and legislation, etc. So I see the actual complaint form itself as being the be best mechanism available to me to walk a potential complainer through the process and to explain to them what I can or can't act upon, what falls within my remit. So at this point in time, we're redesigning uh, the, the complaints form uh, to try to filter the complaints down, narrow them down to those that do fall within our remit and redirect others, you know, that, that don't. Uh, so I think that's the easiest way to engage with a potential complainer to sort of take them step by step through it rather than expect you know them to to gain an understanding of a complex legalistic documentation sure i, I appreciate that, that answer and just the, the the last point i was making is there anything else that that this committee or the parliament itself can do to assist in this or can they leave it alone I don't, uh, uh, not not that comes to mind at the minute. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, my, my approach would be to redesign this complaint form and then monitor, you know, uh, the, the outcome of that to see if it's successful. No doubt there'll be some glitches and we'll have to return and, and iron those out. But uh, that would be, it's, it's a continuous improvement, uh, really, that I, I hope to see happening over, over my term. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Gil. Um, we maybe move on to some questions around lobbying and possibly also public appointments. Neil? Yes, um, in relation to lobbying, it appears um, you, know, you uh, plan for quite a significant amount of time for some of your staff to deal with complaints and lobbying, and there hasn't been any. Is that, would you regard that as uh, uh, the system working or not working? Oh, um, goodness. Uh, I see my function as an open door to take the complaints that do come in, you know, and to action them uh, as appropriate. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't really have a, a, an overall view that I, I could assist the committee with on that matter. Um, I would anticipate that perhaps the lobbying registrar um, would have done some interjurisdictional comparative uh, in terms of um, the, the definitions within the lobbying legislation um, and, and 
and uh, the type of complaints that have eventuated in other jurisdictions uh, to consider if, um, if, if the outcome was as anticipated. Uh, certainly my recollection uh, is that in, in some jurisdictions with lobbying that um, the intention was to extend definitions over time. You know that there would be a betting in period for a few years, the outcome would be considered and then the definitions of those falling within lobbying would, would be revisited with a view to perhaps extending uh, what was caught within the lobbying uh, act. And uh, so is, so is the, the, get the estimate for 45 days of investigating time guesswork? Well, it, it wasn't my guesswork. Uh, it was before my time, okay. and, and but it was necessary because um, uh, the, the member will recall that previously it would have been variable hours um, investigators working on that. So if 45 days worth of lobbying complaints had have eventuated, they would have had to be paid for 45 days, whereas that's no longer the case. So if lobbying complaints did eventuate, that would be caught within our... Okay current provision and, and would not uh, require any additional expenditure within the organisation unless a sudden f unexpected volume yeah. flurry. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, in relation to um, uh, public appointments, you say that um, uh, partnership working has drifted somewhat and you may need to return to a traditional regulatory approach. What does that mean? Seems it's quite coded. <laughs> Uh, or diplomatic or uh, just meant to be brief mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry um so basically again uh, much of this uh, history is before my time but uh so the member would be more aware of it than than i perhaps but my understanding is that the the very significant gains that have been made in diversity happened with the, the assistance of a program board uh, which uh, was um, pivotal in bringing together uh, diffuse, d diffuse diversity actions across government etc uh, to make the, the uh, advances that, that have been seen over the past years and that that program board was disbanded a few years back. Um, so in, in the absence of that board um, my predecessor made various recommendations for Why was it disbanded? Uh, I, will I answer this bit and then I'll let yeah. Yeah, Mr Bruce tell you what uh, so uh, it was disbanded and then my predecessor um, made recommendations uh, for uh, actions that uh, were considered to be meaningful in terms of moving the other diversity metrics um, but the, the Scottish Government uh, hasn't really taken those up and um, I met with the former cabinet secretary a few months back and uh, partnership um, and on certain uh, recommendations on request so when the Scottish government uh, you know decide that they, they want to move on a very on a diversity action that they will approach us for partnership working rather than just adopt all of the recommendations that had previously been made. So the appointments really are operating out with any diversity um, plan, if you like? Are they just happening on an ad hoc basis and in the hope that there's a that we fulfil diversity? Uh, yes, I, I believe uh, that's sort of two different things. These were um, outreach activities, let's say, to try to um, uh, stimulate applications mm -hmm. from various uh, uh, demographics, let's say, uh, and then to uh, progress those to actual applications. So uh, I, I will pass you to Mr. Bruce, who deals with the. So, so of those. Of, of those um events stopped? They have fallen uh, back. They're not as plentiful as they previously were because we used to work in partnership um, with the Scottish okay. Government on those. So there are still some happening. They're just more diffuse. Uh, so, I'm sorry, on, on the other question, I'll pass. Why was the board? Why was the board? Uh, so, uh, good morning, convener and members. Thanks for the good opportunity morning. to provide evidence. Um, 
ultimately that was a matter for the Scottish Government. Uh, the programme board had three strands and public appointments was one of those. Um, I think in terms of our involvement, uh, our interface was with the public appointments team uh, and the partnership approach was fundamentally around a shared action plan to deliver uh, what was a shared strategic objective, which is effective boards reflective of society, as, as members will remember. Um, the government changed tack in terms of its governance arrangements. Um, and, and one of the things that fell out of that was that the government said, well, actually, this action plan is ours. Um, and I think it may be because the prior commissioner had said, well, uh, I feel some of the activity in the plan isn't sufficiently smart uh, and it's not going to deliver on that shared objective. Uh, and whereas we had agreed a plan previously and, and it was pivotal to the delivery of gender di diversity on boards, uh, the government took back ownership. Uh, of that activity. Uh, you'll see some of the things that fell out of that in our annual report. So we had previously agreed that there was going to be a bespoke plan to redress uh, under reflection in terms of disability. Um, and, and the government rolled back on, on that commitment. Um, we shouldn't be too negative about this. I mean, at the end of the day, there is still quite a lot of activity going on. Um, and we have to balance the fact that um, although we might see, wish to see more activity, more central activity um, in order to increase board diversity, um, there has been a significant increase in the number of appointments being made. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, there are a limited number of officials who can chair panels and, and provide administrative support for, for all of that activity. Um, from the annual report in question, you'll have seen the number of applications jumped in the space of a year from 2,000 to roughly 2,800. That's, that's a lot of work. Um, but there is still quite a lot of very good work going on. Um, we still um, do engage in activities together. Last week, uh, myself and the head of the public appointments team were uh, talking at a PATH event. So that was a workshop encouraging people and, and giving them tools to apply for roles. Uh, and that's for people with BME backgrounds um, looking to take up positions in, in public life. Um, I know the government has uh, also undertaken some new activities, so they are um, concentrating on giving constructive feedback to people uh, near misses from competitions with disabilities or BME backgrounds um, who, who weren't successful. Uh, also running workshops again um, for, for both those um, uh, for both those areas. Um, and over and above that, um, we recently agreed a race equality action plan, uh, and they're now implementing some of the actions in that. So uh, we do feel they could be going further, um, but it's not as though there is no activity, uh, and it's not as though that activity, we, we don't expect at least a proportion of that to deliver. Could I ask about um, your involvement in a specific appointment? The, um, the appointment of the uh, chair of the Scottish National Investment Bank was made recently. Um, it was done prior to the bank being set up in law. Um, but would you have expected, given this was a public appointment, to have been consulted on that appointment at least? I'll take that question, Mr Finlay. Um, well, in terms of um, involvement in it, we, we were approached informally on three occasions between June 18 and May 2019 in regards to the particular matter of the National Invest Scottish National Investment Bank. And on all occasions, we advised really in the, the only way that we can advise that we regulate uh, those bodies that fall under our remit and that legislation has to be passed in, in order for that to occur. So I can only regulate bodies that are on, on a list that fall within my remit. Uh, so that had uh, been an exchange, but it happened on three occasions uh, in, the, in the year to uh, May 2019. And then in June 2019, we did receive a, a formal written request from the former cabinet secretary to um, provide oversight of the unregulated appointment of the chair. Um, so we we went back uh, s explaining yet again, really the same thing, that it would be ultra varies because it, it didn't fall within my remit. Um, however, we did point out 
as we pointed out before, that if a Section 3.3 order of the 2003 Act could be in place by the time that the appointment would be made, if we were given that assurance, then that we, we could have acted. So we were wanting to be cooperative and helpful as always, um, but the understanding and a reply that then came through in the following month was that due to time uh, pressures and the need to make the appointment, that that wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't be possible to lay this 3.3 order. So, so um, given that, um, do you think it was wise for the government to proceed to appoint someone out with it without to such an important role without your involvement? Uh, well. Obviously, the Parliament government has put in place the legislation to ensure that those most important appointments are, are carefully considered, carefully regulated. The code has been constructed um, to, to guide those involved in appointments through the process to ensure that uh, appointees are per the requirements of the members and the, and the broader MSP body. Uh, so. Uh, the, the, the letter that I've received uh, from uh, to the uh, Economy Committee from the former Cabinet uh, Secretary says that they can confirm that uh, as part of the process the required fit and proper persons were complete satisfactory for all candidates. Now, the person who was appointed um, will be a key figure in that bank overseeing governance and probity. That person was fined £8.6 million pounds, the biggest ever fine for a conflict of interest case at that time, by regulators. If you had been asked to oversee that, do you think your office would have agreed such an appointment? Um, well, I don't know if I'm able to opine on a hypothetical... Um... Let me stick, well, let's not put it this way. Um, Person A applies for a job. They have been fine, and it's a financial job overseeing a national financial institution on behalf of the government. They have been fined a large amount by the city regulators for irregularities. Do you think you would advise that person A would be appointed? Well, the code of conduct makes these matters very clear, and not only um, is the code of conduct available to the appointing panel but also uh, the very detailed and stringent requirements of the uh, Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential. So what would, sorry, forgive my ignorance, what would the Code of Conduct say in that regard? I'll let uh, Mr Bruce give us chapter and verse. So um, there is a fit and proper person test in the Code of Practice, um, and, and um, one of those tests, um, I, I hope the members won't mind. No, please do. I'll, uh, I'll quote it. Very helpful. Um, there are a number of elements to the fit and proper person test. Um, and one is um, with regards to whether or not... There we are. Uh, and, and just to be clear, it's the responsibility of the appointing minister. Yes. And it is often delegated to the panel. Um, but the, the relevant part is E6... Uh, Two, and uh, the responsibility on the minister is to uh, confirmation that the applicant's conduct to date has been compatible with the public appointment. That's the test. And um, your view on that? Well, it would be for the, the panel member and that, you know, to make the final decision. So where it's delegated, uh, that's, that's an obligation placed on the panel. And if the panel can't reach a view, then that would go back to the minister, and the minister must reach a view on whether or not the conduct um, concerned is compatible. Um, and it's not just the test itself, so there are other elements to it. So if there are questions, then the subject has to be properly investigated, and the person has to be given an opportunity to respond before a final decision is, is made. But at the end of the day, these are ministerial appointments, and it would be for the appointing minister, ultimately, to determine whether or not someone had failed that element of the test. Just a final point. In, in terms of this appointment, are there any other 
um, instances where the same type of thing has happened, where such a prominent public appointment has been made out with the regulated process. Well, sorry, I wasn't, you know, I've only been here for no, nine I months, so in my nine months, no, but uh, yeah. sorry, so you're in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and ultimately, the ones that we regulate are the ones that we know about. Of course. Uh, you know, I, I'm not looking to deflect, um, but all of this information is in the public domain. Okay. So, yeah, there have been any number of appointments made that have been regulated and that are not, and, and equally, there are currently appointments that are made that are unregulated um, and it would be for members to take a view on whether or not those were significant and ought to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Um, thanks uh, Mr Bruce. And Jamie, do you have a wee follow-up there? Yeah, it was just a very quick question maybe as a clarification. Can I you confirm your office was approached three times informally by the same, by the Cabinet Secretary or the... the let me just so uh, over the year we were um, uh, approached variously by sponsor team and then uh, public appointments team and then sponsor team uh, again in May 19 um, uh, that uh, derived from a committee in private session having asked the cabinet secretary to come to me to, for oversight of the appointment process okay and the, your answer was the same each I, I, well, in, each in each case, there's only one answer we can give. Yeah. You know, it's the situation's fairly cut and dried. You know. Okay, thanks. Why did they keep coming back? Here? So, I'm not entirely clear about that, but but I think it's it's helpful to clarify um, when the act was established. So while a bill was going through, it was understood that there would be occasions on which it would be appropriate to provide oversight of a body before it's been established mm -hmm. and the act includes that order making power for ministers uh, no dubiety about it so even before a body is established section 33 of the act allows a body to be treated as though it were regulated um, and in, in order for us to act lawfully for the commissioner to act lawfully we really do need that as a minimum in order to provide that oversight. Can I just ask very, uh, the last question was, do you know under whose or what direction those those approaches were made? Um, Ian, Ian, can you recall? Sorry, I didn't take the... Um, so, I mean, ultimately, from our perspective, we regulate the activities of the Scottish ministers, and I think any approach that comes to us from an official, any Scottish government official, that's that's made on behalf of the Scottish ministers, it would be inappropriate for us to treat it otherwise. So wh why do you think they might have made the same approach essentially three times informally? Um, what would be the reasons or intentions behind that? So my understanding is, and, and it's, it's the function of the Commissioner, it's one of the Commissioner's statutory functions to offer guidance on application of the code. Um, and it's obviously important for us as an organisation to, um, to provide that guidance when it's sought. But you provided and the same guidance three, indeed, three, and, and, three times. And to be consistent in doing so, yes. And, and we were consistent in terms of the guidance that we provided. Could I, could, yeah, just to finish this, could you clarify, I'm not quite... Uh, following the section 3.3 thing what, what does that actually mean then um, does that mean that the, 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 the act has to be passed approved by parliament no. before this comes in so, no. or, or what, what needs to happen then no um, so uh, it's it's a it's it's subordinate legislation it's right. it's an instrument so, so the that, instrument could have gone through that would allow you to that could have gone through at any time before the um, yes. Legislation um, was passed. Yes. Um, so uh, I am uh, looking to recall what was in the letter that we ultimately received from Mr. Mackay. I'm sure it's in the public domain in any case. But um, as I understand it, uh, the concern of the ministers was um, whether or not it was appropriate <coughs> to lay a section 33 order when stage one of a bill has not passed. Um, because ultimately, if stage one of the bill establishing a body hasn't passed, then um, one could argue that the will of the Parliament wasn't clear on whether or not that body should be established. So I think their 
uh, my understanding is that their custom and practice is not to lay a Section 3.3 order until stage one of a bill has passed. Uh, you'll excuse me, I'm not a lawyer, um, but, uh, um, but as I un understand it, there is no legislative impediment to the laying of a 3.3 order at any time. Thank you very much for that. Thanks very much, Mr Bruce. That's very helpful. Um, can we move on to Mark Roscoe, please? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can I just go back to the issue about uh, diversity uh, within public appointments and boards? Um, you described in the annual report the achievement of gender diversity, uh, sorry, gender balance within public boards is truly remarkable uh, last year. Are there, are there particular reasons where, or approaches that you can pick out as to how that was achieved and what are the what are the lessons for for wider society and particularly women's participation um, well basically the uh, learnings from uh, the the five-year process that was involved in reaching that stage have been encapsulated in the public appointments uh, report um, so again I'll ask uh, Mr Bruce here to give you the detail um, because very much the attitude that we've taken is that the learnings should be taken from the great success and they were reflected in the recommendations that were made by my predecessor mm -hmm. um, for further diversity action uh, but then uh, the, the Scottish Government have decided not to, to move on that at, at uh, present uh, in its entirety but rather simply take a, an approach which involves partnership working uh, on request as it were uh, but not that that's um, minor they're still doing a lot of work there just not taking all the recommendations but perhaps uh, Ian could give you some more detail on those learnings and um, I understand um, that our time is limited um, but uh, and I hope not to unnecessarily repeat some of the things that I've said to the committee previously um, there is no magic bullet to um, achieve uh, redressing under reflection uh, on boards and a whole range of measures had to be put in place uh, in order to achieve what was achieved um, and it really is significant and, and other administrations um, have looked on in envy and, and sought to find the answer um, and unfortunately I, uh, in those cases as I'm going to say to the committee now um, there is no single answer um, a number of things certainly helped so the introduction of a core skills framework um, which we put together jointly alongside the Scottish Government. Um, it may not sound like a significant thing, but, um, but it was a, a tool that selection panels could use to much more clearly articulate what was needed for a given board at a given point in time. It assisted the appointing minister to be clear in terms of their definition of merit. Um, and we saw merit being defined differently uh, and in different ways to the way in which it had been defined previously. Uh, it meant more uh, more transparent um, decision making by selection panels. So that's one technical thing. But over and above that, you need to take positive action measures, and that's about targeting the people um, that you want to attract to particular roles. Uh, and we saw lots of evidence of that um, bearing fruit. Uh, and it wasn't just in isolation. So. Uh, Examples include boards holding open days alongside organisations like Changing the Chemistry, uh, targeting groups, so women in business, the IOD and their female membership, that side of things. So those packages of measures uh, ultimately led to the difference that we've seen. Um, one of the members here today asked me last year whether or not boards themselves might um, do more uh, in terms of attraction and I think there's certainly still scope for that to be done mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and disability is slightly different um, and the challenge attached to that is different. Uh, I, I do believe there is scope for boards in terms of the way they operate to be more accessible uh, and I think that would see a difference in terms of changing the numbers there. Um, and uh, and I know that the government, uh, alongside us, is doing some very good work at, uh, in that area at the moment. Um, we are running a, a scheme whereby people with disabilities supported by Inclusion Scotland are shadowing existing board members. Mm -hmm. So not only are they 
uh, given an opportunity to develop some of the experience and skills that they might need in order to apply for board roles successfully, but equally the boards are learning from them. Uh -huh. uh, things like whether or not the papers that are provided to the committee are provided in an accessible format, whether or not the body's website is accessible. It's a two-way street, mm -hmm. uh, and it's things like that that I think we mm -hmm. need to see in future in order to move the needle in, in other areas. But um, what I, about programmes to encourage BME board members? Because I'm aware that yes. you know, with with gender balance, yes. we reached that yes. last year. Yes. I mean, I hope that doesn't then go in reverse. Indeed. Um, clearly, there's a job of work to be done to ensure that that doesn't happen. But Agreed. when we look at the figures for people with declared disability yep. BME board members. Yep. You know, it's going down, so it yes. appears to be going in the wrong direction. Yes. So despite the kind of approaches that you describe, it, it strikes me that there's a gap or that they're, they're not really cutting through to deliver yes. the diversity and balance that we need. Is that fair, fair to say? Uh, yes, but there are programmes underway. Uh, I, I, I think there was a hiatus. I, mean, I don't want to be mundane about this, but there were changes in personnel and these things actually make a difference in terms of central activity. Uh, I think I've seen some revival in relation to some of that. I mentioned the Race Equality Action Plan, so that has now been agreed with stakeholder organisations and it is now being rolled out uh, and it includes a number of strands. I'd be happy to provide the committee with a copy if, yeah. if uh, that was felt to be uh, helpful. I mean, you did say earlier, we, mm. in answer to Mr Finlay, you, know, you again described a lot of the programmes and approaches that are, that are underway. But you also said that government could go further. Yes. So what are the areas where you could go a lot further in terms of encouraging that diversity? Um, well, I've, I've, I've mentioned some of the responsibilities that boards themselves might wish to take on. Um, and, and, and one of the other things, um, so the Commissioner mentioned the thematic reviews um, and, and government not necessarily taking on board some of the recommendations. I think a key one from my perspective is learning lessons from round to round. So, um, and, and we do produce good practice case studies, but um, uh, we produced some previously in relation to the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, and it's obliged to have disabled mem members. And so the activities that they engage in in order to attract and recruit new members, we could see that being adopted in other contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and But what that requires is government to take an overview of all the activity that's going on and say, well, we can see that this has worked in these areas. Let's adopt that much more widely. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps where we're not seeing evidence of the sort of activity that we'd, that we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. um, could, I, could I just yeah. um, finish, please, by saying that uh, the other thing that we must uh, take into account is the other external barriers uh, that certain... Um, uh, certain demographics face for, and uh, in the early days of my term uh, I wrote to Lord Holmes in relation to the issue that disabled persons face in that benefits are potentially impacted uh, on the appointment to a public body mm. and this is very off-putting uh, and really uh, it, it makes it a very unappealing um, premise to, to apply mm. even if, if it's going to impact uh, the benefits. Mm. Uh, you know, so I see that as, w with all the best will in the world mm. and a lot of outreach activity, I feel that will not pass go, as it were, mm -hmm. you know, until the like of that problem is, is uh, faced up to and resolved in some way. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just want to sort of balance the, the mm -hmm. discussion with that comment. Yeah, yeah, message understood. Um, the figures also show that only... 18.3% of people on the boards of public bodies are under the age of 50. Um, that's pretty low. I mean, do you have figures for people under the age of 40 or even people, <laughs> imagine this, under the age of 30 actually getting onto public boards? Uh, yes, it happens. Um, and, and we do have those figures. I mean, so um, the report's quite lengthy anyway, as our auditors previously um, observed, which is why we now have a separate public appointments report. But you know, anything that's of interest to the committee, we, we can happily provide. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it, a lot of it is around what a minister asks for, for a particular post. So um, one of my favourite examples is Sports Scotland. I might have uh, mentioned it previously, but we have a case study on the website there. 
Um, and in terms of the skill sets that were sought, uh, that certainly delivered um, all sorts of diversity, including um, people under the age of 30. Um, but uh, if a board feels that someone with knowledge, current up-to-date knowledge of social media is something that's going to be very important to it, um, that has a direct impact on the demographic of the people whom you're attracting and, and may ultimately appoint. Mm -hmm. So is that enough then, in, in, just for there to be greater consideration of the skills and merits? So no, or, it's, or is it's, there a yeah, more it's, of a it's, conscious it's all, decision yeah, to, to start to yeah, make indeed. some of these posts appeal Agreed. to young people and to look at the structural barriers yes. that perhaps prevent them from uptaking yes. those yeah, posts? Yes, you're absolutely right. As I said previously, um, there is no single answer. That's one part of it. But the other parts are outreach. How do you attract people to apply? Are the activities of the boards themselves going to be sufficiently attractive to people um, who are of working age, may have caring responsibilities? All of these are factors, and they all have an influence on whether or not people are willing to apply, whether or not they're successful when they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And we just round off this section with Jamie Halker Johnson, please. Thanks very much. Um, I come from an island. I represent the Highlands and Islands. I was wondering how you ensure a geographical split. There's obviously a lot of talented people. Uh, in some of the more um, remote rural parts of Scotland, how do you ensure that they can play an active role in these boards too? Uh, well, that is addressed uh, by the minister when the minister is looking at uh, the what, what a, a, an applicant that they want to attract to the post, uh, what that looks like essentially. Um, so that would be a consideration that's taken into account by the minister, uh, but certainly at, at, at that stage, at that planning stage. Um, but from my point of view, in terms of the code, um, when we're revising the code of practice towards the end of this year, uh, we'll be looking at any areas where there's under delivery and uh, we can certainly um, take into account uh, representation geographically uh, if that is an area that needs uh, strengthened within the code. Uh, I'm aware that there is a, a legal um, change afoot uh, to ensure representation of people in the islands is strengthened going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, we'll just be heading into a final uh, range of questions, please, and a draft strategic plan uh, which you have produced. And uh, Alexander, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Commissioner, you, you spoke about earlier about the inheriting a, an organisation that required to be reviewed, and I think you have given evidence today that that has taken place in your recovery plan that you put into uh, uh, place and how that has uh, progressed. Uh, in your governance statement, you talk about the, the risk management issues that you have and also the overall assessment of effective governance arrangements. Uh, and within that, you talk about the provision of a robust set of risk management policies uh, and, and how that will be uh, part of the, the quality improvement going forward. Uh, can you maybe expand as to how you see that developing? Uh, because that's a very important part uh, of ensuring that the future of the organisation is robust enough uh, and can challenge and can be affected. Uh, that is quite correct. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, I ha have a strong risk management background, having been chief risk officer in a funds management firm. Uh, so I can only agree uh, that risk management is uh, in many ways um, the, the key to the robustness of an organisation going forward. Um, however, uh, just having lots of multicoloured papers and ex extensive, uh, a range of committees and subcommittees and discussions, I'm afraid, does not, as we know from the financial crisis, in any way uh, insulate us mm -hmm. from uh, the, the problems uh, that, that may be encountered. So that being the case, um, I have really been on the forefront of uh, uh, governance in my organisation. Uh, so part of that has been to assemble a senior management team uh, with, that, with persons uh, who are here with me and also back in the office uh, where we meet on a very regular basis really to discuss risks arising. And I very much work on a team basis and uh, take the advice and counsel of those around me. 
goodness, on an hourly basis, not a daily mm -hmm. basis or a monthly basis, constantly, because it's such a dynamic environment. So that will then be translated into, uh, you know, the, the record, the risk management register in the organisation. And the thing that we we'll have to do is make that very real. However, from mm. the day and hour I took over, I see that really there is one risk at the centre and forefront, and that is del delivery of the statutory function. That's what I'm here for. That's why the members have appointed me. So that that remains the, the leading risk, and it's everything that, uh, you know, uh, backfills to make sure that that happens, which will be encapsulated over the, in the risk management register going forward, the risk register and the risk management policy going forward. And following on from your strategic developments that you've set in place, uh, you, you talked about in the report a training needs analysis. Uh, I think training is vitally important to ensure that you have uh, individuals who have the capacity, uh, who have the training, uh, who have the knowledge base uh, and the understanding. Uh, uh, and there was obviously a bit of lack of that when you came into the process. Uh, but you, you have now identified that as one of the, the main areas for development. And can I ask, uh, have you any uh, possible areas that you've seen for, for that to be an opportunity to develop in the short to medium term? Uh, surely. Whilst I feel that the, uh, the new staff I've recruited in the investigation area are well ahead of the curve, as it were, uh, the thing is we are uh, operating in a dynamic environment and uh, social media uh, and the, the, the many intricacies that are involved with investigating a case there, for example, is something which is constantly changing. Uh, so in joining a network of investigating uh, public bodies which are dedicated to investigation of complaints such as ourselves. Um, we're looking to uh, jointly attend some training uh, on social media related mm -hmm. investigations to ensure that we're well placed to find and capture any evidence available to us there. But by joining with other members of this network, we can cut the cost involved in doing so. Uh, so that, that's one area that I, I feel it's always essential to keep out front of. And again, in moving forward, as and when, uh, we um, have the legislation for the sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour. Mm -hmm. I recognise that's a time that we may um, invest mm -hmm. in expertise in that area to ensure we're uh, dealing with potentially vulnerable witnesses uh, in, in the best possible manner. Yeah. So those and, are two. Sorry. Yeah, and, 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 and you've, you've identified that there's a, there's a need for someone who has a, a different organisation skill or a different face up to, to deal with some of these locations and individuals that are, are in that situation. Uh, and, and also within the, the report, you talk about the, your technical objectives and your technical developments that you, and you've touched on the social media, but are there other, other areas that will address and support uh, your staff and your team uh, that are of a technical base uh, that would you know, advise and help uh, in some way to, to bridge some of those gaps that you've identified uh, that would that would save time, that would save process, that would actually encapsulate what you're trying to achieve? Uh, well, yes, we're obviously wanting to um, embrace technology in any way we can to uh, drive efficiency, effectiveness and robustness. Uh, so, uh, for example, the confidentiality and security of uh, the, the complaint material, the sensitive material, uh, uh, is of utmost importance and therefore we're right up to date on our cyber security credentials. We have multi-layer encryption on all of our uh, devices etc. Uh, we have uh, very careful um, use of remote uh, access only for senior people etc. So uh, all of the technology, the cloud, we're looking at one of the things in the strategic plan is to look at use of the cloud as a backup to ensure again robustness uh, so indeed uh, and uh, we uh, we're going to look at what's available which will change over time obviously over my term and make sure that we're ahead of that in terms of uh, providing the statutory service to my best possible ability and, and all of that comes at a cost 
uh, and within your own budget, you've you've indicated today that you're you're looking at some savings, but you'll have to expand uh, some of that, uh, and there may be requirement for you to uh, spend more and require more funds to achieve some of the goals that you're actually trying to uh, achieve. Yes, that's quite correct, and that's why in my strategic plan the costings are provided in two different schedules. The first schedule um, reflects business as usual, as it were, and whilst it, it does go up over the years, that's essentially um, cost of living percentage, inflation per percentage, and the staff moving up through the points on the scale, as it were, whereas I've provided a separate schedule to show these additional costs, which, as I may say, are very modest because I'm very keen not to spend the taxpayers' money unless I have to. But um, I, I have uh, included some modest costings here uh, to assist in achieving these objectives in the second schedule, and they will be requested in the year concerned and be public. Uh, be subject to SPCB case. approval and consideration with uh, you know explanations uh, and quotes etc to back them up at that time and, and as you've rightly identified if, if you are trying to achieve uh, and improve the system then you need the resources to make that happen do. that's right yes thank you convener. thank you thank you Alexander thank you commissioner um well I'd like to thank the commissioner uh, and Ian Bruce and Martin Campbell for attending today. That's been very helpful. It's been open and good guidance and um, all the best for going forward. Thank you very much indeed. Now, that ends the public part of the meeting. The committee will now move into private session and allow time for the public to leave. Thank you very much.